What an honor it is to be in the house of God. I tell you, I could sing, worship was ridiculous. And I just, when every time I sing that song, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. I just, again, I never lose sight of what He's done for me. I love the fact that we did communion this morning. I love that it says every time, every time you do this, every time, we should be doing it every morning. (laughs) Every morning, remembering that which He has done for us. Oh, He is worthy, He is worthy, He is worthy. Let's just close our eyes and let's just welcome the Word of God to transform our heart this morning. I believe God has is is set up this Word today. I was gonna speak on something else and I just kept getting this Word that would go over and over my heart. And I love that worship has literally confirmed that which this Word is about to be because I know God is intentional. I know God wants to speak and encourage you. So Father, I thank You for this Word that You've given me. God, I thank You for Your Word, Your Word that is true. It's alive, it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword and it divides between soul, spirit, joint and marrow and it judges the attitudes and thoughts of our hearts. So God, I just pray right now that Your Word, let it do what only You can do in us, Father. And I pray that it encourages us, it builds us up, and it causes us to remember once again that You are faithful even when we are faithless. And so God, I pray You would anoint these words. In Your Name we pray, Amen. Well, on your way down, why don't you say hi to the person next to you? Maybe you don't know them. Introduce yourself. Tell them they look wonderful this morning. We had a great day yesterday, as you saw on that fall carnival. And um, I just want to honour and thank our team. And, and just hold your applause for a minute. Just hold it for a minute. Because honestly, you know, Pastor Henry and I often get ideas and visions. And, you know, it, it doesn't just happen. You don't just wake up and see that everything's done. And I love that our team will always just roll with the punches with us. And I was like, you know what? I want to do a fall festival carnival thing. And, and you know, the team were just on it. And so can you just honour our staff, our team, who literally never do things in half measure. And uh, I just want to honour the team for just being absolutely amazing. I want to thank every servant leader that came out, every person that did a trunk, everyone that went all out because you did this because you love people. And it was just so fun. And even though the rain was annoying, it wasn't even like a wash. It was just annoying. Enough for me to have washed and blow dried my hair the day before. And if you know my hair, it's frizzy. And so any humidity or any water that goes to it. And so I'm literally walking around with a rain hat all day yesterday. And everyone's like, who are you? I'm like, I'm my mother. Because this is what she, <laughs> she would do. No shame. That rain hat over her head looking very weird. So I was my mum. God bless you, Lena. Um, But uh, we had such a fun day and uh, just really want to honour and thank our church because I don't think uh, we really understand what amazing people we have. But this word, oh, I'm excited to share it after worship this morning. I love it when God confirms through worship. I always go, you're in the flow, guys. So Cody and Chantrice, in the flow. And I was just so encouraged. So I'm just going to read to you from Mark chapter 4, verse 35. It says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall storm came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. 
Today, I just want to speak to you from the word, the thought, this one word that has been resonating in my heart personally for months now. But I was reminded of this word as I was praying and I was actually preparing a completely different message, um, which I will speak another day. But I was preparing this message and every time I would lay my head in the pillow and I would, I'm always praying, God, what are you wanting to say, your people? I don't want to say what I want to say. I want to say what you're saying to your people. And all I kept getting was this word that the Lord gave me personally in March. And I lived and marinated and studied in this word for myself because this was a word for me. And I never brought it to the church because I knew God was speaking to me about a particular situation. And I remember I'd been going through a a crisis of personal a personal situation, a personal family situation that was very dear to my heart and it was causing me uh, great distress. It was an internal personal issue that I really didn't disclose with very many people because it was very painful. And as pastors, I think sometimes you all think that we've got it all together and that we, we just soldier on and we do that because we know how to encourage us in the Lord. But make no mistake, pray for your pastors because we go through issues too. And we go through circumstances that are beyond our control. And we go through where enemy comes in to bring an attack on our families and we need the Lord. And so I was going through this personal personal uh, pain that I just couldn't see light at the end of the tunnel. And my friend, my beautiful friend, Pastor Stephanie E.K. had come in March to preach. And um, she didn't even preach on this topic at all. It was just an off the cuff statement that she made during her preach. But it was the word of the Lord that I needed personally at that time. And she just said, Jesus was unbothered when he was in the boat. And I can't even tell you, it was like the Holy Spirit just came with a word in my heart and I just began to weep. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, Alex, I need you to learn how to be unbothered. I need you how to learn to be unbothered in the midst of a storm. And when the enemy throws up a storm, because that's what it was, because he rebuked the storm. It was from the enemy and he rebuked the storm and then he said to the waves, he says, when that storm rises up in your life, I need you to learn how to be unbothered. And my word for this message today is simply to be unbothered bothered. I believe God's going to do something in each of our lives. Whether you are going through something or not, you will eventually go through something that is going to require you to remember this sermon and this one word, and that is to be unbothered. I want to look at this text and I just want to break it down. What does unbothered actually mean? It just means showing or feeling a lack of concern about or interest in something. A lack of concern, showing a lack of concern or feeling about something. I don't know about you, but when I have things out of my control, I'm not unbothered. I'm actually very bothered about it. It's so bothering that it takes up sleep. It takes up time. It takes up thoughts. It takes up stress in my life. It takes up action. It takes me thinking. I, I, I'm consumed by what is bothering me. And some of us get bothered about a lot of things. And sometimes so many things come and bother us. I feel like the enemy, this is what he loves to do. He's specialising in. He specialises in bothering us. He bothers us in our ears. He, he troubles us. He disturbs us. He destroys our peace. He ruffles our feathers. He disturbs and He causes worry, right? That is the hallmark of the enemy. He loves to bring anxiety and worry and concern. But as believers, we need to learn just like Jesus was. He was teaching His disciples to be unbothered. Because Jesus was so unbothered by this situation. 
He was so unbothered about this situation that he was so dead asleep. Now, you've got to think about these boats if you've ever been on the Sea of Galilee. I have not, but I have seen pictures of people on these boats. But it's not like a ship like we have now. It's not like you're covered completely. I mean, when there are waves and uh, 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 wind blowing, water is crashing on in and he's in the stern, he's at the back of the boat and surely there is water coming on. I'm thinking, how is Jesus sleeping when there's water coming all over him? I mean, we just got sprinkled yesterday and I was bothered about the sprinkle. Imagine waves, and I'm not a water person per se. I'm, I'm not the person that goes out on yachts and boats, even though I've been asked many, many times by friends who own beautiful yachts, and I'm like, uh, no thanks, that'll be a pass for me, because I don't actually know how to swim. Um, that's a fun fact about me. I don't know how to swim, and so for me, being on that boat, I would be absolutely terrified. I can't even watch movies about people sinking and drowning and because it literally is, it's a distress to me. So I can't even imagine what these guys, but these guys, some of them were fishermen. They understood storms. They knew how to navigate storms. But yet I want to bring our attention because again, every word in the Word of God is on purpose and it is for our good. And he says here that day when evening came, He'd been preaching all day. He'd been ministering all day. He says to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Now, I think sometimes we take for granted when God says something to us that we kind of go, yeah, yeah, but you don't really mean it. Now, when Jesus says, let's go over to the other side, he doesn't suspect or anticipate not making it to the other side. Can I get an amen? If he says we're going to the other side, make no mistake, they will make it to the other side. So whatever happens in between, he's unbothered about it because he's made a declaration and everything that Jesus speaks, he completes. And he says, we are going to the other side. Now for me in my life, when I was going through this pain, and I'm telling you, it nearly took me out personally. I wanted to give up, I wanted to lay down, I wanted to go, I'm done, because I was in the middle of a storm that took me out personally. And I remember this word when I heard it right here on this front row, Alex, I need you to be unbothered. And the reason why I need you to be unbothered because I need you to remember what I said to you about this situation. And I look back over the years for 17 years, I had had a word in my heart about this situation. 17 years, the Lord said, this will be done. The word that was spoken over this particular situation is we're gonna get to the other side. I've made a promise. I've made a declaration that this shall come to pass. So did I say it 17 years ago? I said, yes, you did, Lord. Have I said it every year since? Yes, you have, Lord. Have I confirmed it in your heart? Yes, you have, Lord. So if I say we're going to the other side, then I need you to learn to be unbothered. What's He said to you? What's He declared over your life that right now you feel like you're in the middle of a storm? You feel like He has said something and it looks completely chaotic. I love that song where it just says there is peace in Chaos, peace in chaos. Have How do we have peace in chaos? See, this is something the world doesn't have. This is something the world doesn't know how to uh, uh, navigate. This is something the world does not show others when chaos is all around, where there is a shaking going on, where there is a tremble in your life. Do you have peace or are you just like everybody else? that's just caught up in the chaos, just caught up in being bothered and worried and stressed with anxiety and fear and you're crippled and you shrink back. And what Jesus was trying to teach these disciples is how to be unbothered in the midst of a storm. And I'm talking about the storms of life that the enemy loves to throw at you. They come out of nowhere. But he said, 
Let's go over to the other side. I remember Jesus saying the same thing in John 11 to his disciples when they, he got word that Lazarus was sick. And they said, Jesus, Mary and Martha are calling you because their brother is sick. The one you love is sick. And what does Jesus say to his disciples? He says, this sickness shall not end in death. So he chooses to stay a couple more days. You see, Jesus was unbothered about the situation. Everybody else was bothered. Everybody else was stressed. Lazarus is dying. Where is Jesus? I need him here because if he is here, things change. And yet Jesus declared, this sickness shall not end in death. He was unbothered. He's like, he's just asleep. And the disciples just didn't understand because, again, he was doing something that he's wanting to teach his people that when he declares something and when he says something, we need to learn how to activate the trust and the faith level that if Jesus is unbothered about it, I need to be unbothered about it also. If he's unbothered, then I'm unbothered. 2020 revealed Jesus was unbothered. But we were bothered. We were so bothered We were so distressed. We were freaking out. We were like, where are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I'm unbothered. Because, sweetheart, we've been here thousands of years. And I'm still here. And I'm the same yesterday, today, and to forever. And the church is still alive and well. And I'm still on the throne. So I'm unbothered. Oh, if we could be the house of God, that is unbothered. A storm came up. It just came up out of nowhere. Jesus knew. He's omniscient. He knows when the storms of life are gonna come up in your life. It comes up. Storms will come. Storms will come to take you out. When things are beyond your control, when things that you realise, oh my gosh, I think God is actually allowing this to reveal what's actually inside of me. Because what was inside of me, guys, was I was a first class control freak. I didn't even realise what a control freak I was until I went through this storm. Because what I had been doing is I had been curating and I had been navigating and I had been building a life that I wanted to see come to fruition. I got in the way of making it how I needed it to be because of the way I interpreted God's Word over this situation. So here I am curating, here I am manipulating, here I am working it out in my strength and God is saying, who are you? Would you let go of this situation? It's not for you to control. I'm in control of this situation. Get your hands off. And what this storm made me realise is that when I'm not in control, I don't do very well. God had to speak to me and say, stop being a control freak. You are damaging this situation. And I want you to realise that the thing that we freak out about when storms come into our life is that when we're not in control, we don't believe God is either. And today I want to remind you that God who is the same yesterday, today and forever, the God who went, came through from the beginning of time, who's come through in every single Bible story that you have read, it is precedent for us to see that He comes through and that He is faithful even when we are faithless. He is saying when the storms come up, I need you to relinquish control because some things are going to be out of your control, but you need to trust me because here he was sleeping. He's asleep. Now we need to understand that Jesus was fully man and fully God at the same time. He was human and he was exhausted. I know what that is like. I can't even imagine. I mean, I remember when we prayed for people here for six and a half hours, I was exhausted for about three days after Sunday. I was like, Jesus, how on earth did you minister to the thousands? He would have been exhausted. He was a man, yet he was God. And here we don't understand whether he was asleep just because he was exhausted because he was preaching all day or whether he was just so unbothered that he was teaching the disciples a lesson. I'm gonna go to sleep, boys. And no matter what happens, we're getting to the other side. You see, he knew 
And this is what we don't understand. God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. This, this storm, it wasn't the way he was being taken out. He knew that his mission was actually to die on a cross. His mission was to be the sacrificial lamb. So he wasn't going to be drowning and being taken out by a storm. So he's like, guys, my time has not yet come. This isn't what's going to take us out. I'm unbothered about this, but I want to teach you something in the process that when storms arise over your life, I need you to sleep like a baby. See, in Proverbs 3.24, it says, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Psalm 4.8 says, In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. I want to speak to you today, those of you that are watching online, those of you that are sitting here and your sleep is being stolen. Your sleep is actually ruining your life. Your sleep is meant for rest and for recuperation. There are some of you that are such control freaks that you don't sleep because you're sitting in bed worrying about everything. You're working things out. You think you are the master of your own fate and your sleep is being robbed. You are insomniacs. You are so riddled with fear, anxiety and pain. And I'm here to tell you today that God wants to break that over your life because He we need you to learn to be unbothered. Sleep was a gift from the Lord to rejuvenate and regenerate your cells, your body, your mind, your soul. It's incredible. My husband was uh, having a procedure on Friday and he wasn't able to sleep through the night because he had to take certain medication through the whole night. And when we went to hospital Friday morning, they checked his blood pressure and uh, he normally has perfect blood pressure. And when they took his blood pressure, they said it was high. And she says, that's what lack of sleep does to you. It's not healthy. It's not healthy for us to lose sleep. But the enemy loves us losing sleep. The enemy wants us dull during the day. So what's he gonna do? Have you toss and turn all night so that you are dull, desensitized, exhausted, anxious, weary, and you are not effective. Oh, he knows what he's doing when he causes anxiety. And I believe right now I'm touching on something in the spirit that God wants to break by the end of this service in Jesus' name. Because he wants us to be unbothered. He wants us to be in perfect peace. He wants us to understand that He's the God of in control. He's got every day numbered. He's got every day worked out. And sometimes when storms come, He's actually trying to teach you how to gain authority over your storm. And that's what He was doing for me, that He was asleep. And the disciples were terrified and it's amazing that when they went to wake Jesus, I'm sure they were freaking out. And I love the verbiage here because I think this is right where it's at and this is where it really revealed what I truly believed about my God in this situation. He says, don't you care if we drown? Oh, I think that's the cry of a desperate heart that doesn't understand that they're God's for them. I love that Josh said he is for you. His body was for you. Yet when we get in a storm, what, what's the first thing some of us do? God, where are you? Don't you care if I die? Don't you care if I'm suffering? Don't you care if things are going pear-shaped? Where are you? Uh, why are you asleep on my watch? I feel abandoned. I feel vulnerable. For me, it was actually the core of my heart where I felt God was being unfaithful in my situation. It felt like Jesus was asleep. It felt like my storm was so uncontrollable and Jesus was like, you're on your own, honey. That's what it felt like and that's what I believed the lie. I felt like the enemy was encroaching upon our family in such a serious way that I couldn't see light at the end of the tunnel and I was taken out. I was bothered. I was worried. I was anxious. I was in pain. I was consumed with fear. I didn't sleep a lot during that time. But what God had to show me is that instead of worrying, I need to learn how to pray. Instead of worrying and tossing and turning, I need to get up and start declaring. And some of you choose to worry, toss and turn instead of getting up and pray. But what I was actually saying is, God, you're unfaithful. You're unfaithful. You're unfaithful. 
what I realized is that I'd actually made a bargain with God. Can I just suggest, you know, in hindsight, <laughs> don't make bargains with God. <laughs> he is God, you are not. And uh, I made a bargain. I said, God, if I do this for you, just make sure you take care of X, Y. And when I felt like he wasn't taking care of Y, I was like, you failed your end of the bargain. And I felt the rebuke of the Holy Spirit so gentle but so strong. He said to me, how dare you say that I am unfaithful? I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished yet. You don't get the right to say I'm unfaithful until the work is done. And may I have you remember that I love this person more than you ever have. I ordained this person before the foundations of the earth to be here for such a time as this. So why don't you get your little greasy hands off the situation and leave it to me because I love her more than you and I need you to be un. It's a word for some of us. It's a word for some of you because, oh, we can sing these songs on the mountaintop when everything's great. But what happens when you're going through the storm? What happens when you're going through the valley of the shadow of death? What happens when things aren't turning out the way you perceive them to turn out? Are you declaring that God is faithful? Are you remaining steadfast? Are you remaining true to the Word of God? Are you saying, God, you can be trusted? Because here I am, Pastor Alex, who went through one of the biggest storms of her life, declaring that God was unfaithful. And I say that in vulnerability, in, 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 now that I've crossed over to the other side. I would never have said that during, because that would have really depleted our faith. If Pastor Alex doesn't even have faith, how am I gonna get faith? But I wanna teach you this because I want you to see that we all go through this. We all go through circumstances that test our faith. The cry is the ultimate cry of fear and doubt, actually. And so when a storm actually erupts in your life, I actually believe it's an opportunity for us to kill the fear and the doubt. But some of us actually just live with the fear and the doubt. And we actually just get through it. But what we've now done is we've partnered with fear and doubt so that the next storm comes, we're even worse. But what God's actually wanting to do is teach you how to overcome fear and doubt so that when other storms come at you, you are ready. Hmm. Unbelievable, hey? It's, it's this abandonment issue. It's this issue that we don't believe God is for us personally, that we've got to deal with. You've got to get the root issue of why you feel like God's not trustworthy. And you've got to deal with it. And I had to deal with it right then and there. I had to repent. And when I repent, I felt God say, now I need you to rebuke the devourer, just like I rebuked the wind. And then he said to the waves. So he rebuked the wind, the thing that was causing the storm. And the effect of the wind caused the waves to try and take their boat out. And he says, now you get to speak to it. And what I had to learn is I needed to get in the posture of number one, understanding that ultimately God is in control. Number two, that he told me and promised me that we would get to the other side. Now it was my job to get up because I actually believe he was wanting the disciples to do this because they had just witnessed the feeding of the thousands. They had just witnessed God do miracles. And he is literally like, uh, uh, excuse me, kids, do you still not have any faith? I've been in ministry for 27 years. I've been a Christian for 37 years and yet, there are still areas where my faith is developing and growing and the Lord is saying, come on, Alex, where is your faith? So instead of going, well, I don't believe and I just can't understand, I've had to go to the Word and go, okay, you rebuked the wind and you spoke to the waves. Therefore, I'm going to rebuke the devourer that is trying to cause chaos in my family and I'm going to speak to this situation with all authority that you have given me and I will command this thing to go low and Jesus will have the final say. And so I would get up every morning and instead of being in my angst and my worry and my fear, oh, I began to declare 
I began to put oil every single place of my household. I would go and I would pray and I would prophesy and I would remind the enemy of who God is and I would remind God of who He is and I would remind myself of the fact that the promises of God are yes and amen and no more fear, no more anxiety. But you know what happened to me in the process? I let go of control. And when I let go of control, you wouldn't believe it, but everything changed. (laughs) Everything began to turn. Everything began to turn. And it's not like it happened the next day. It's not even happened the next month. But as I began to relinquish control, as I began to rebuke the devourer and speak to the storm, I changed. You see, so many of you right now are in a storm and you're wanting another person to change. You're wanting the circumstance to change. But actually what God's doing in and amongst this is teaching you, you need to change. You need to change. Because sometimes we are the issue. Sometimes we are the roadblock. Sometimes we are the stumbling block of the miracle. Because we are tying the hands of God by being in control. We're tying the hands of God when we're manipulating the situation. We're tying the hands of God when we're telling Him how it should look. We're tying the hands of God when we are in somebody else's business, not allowing the Holy Spirit to do the convicting. And God's actually only ever asked you to pray and speak, pray and speak, rebuke and speak, get into that prayer closet. And when He did that, the wind died down. It was completely calm. And he said, why are you so afraid if the band could come? Do you still have no faith? See, the meaning of this whole parable is just that wherever Jesus is, you're going to be all right. Wherever Jesus is, he brings a calm. Wherever Jesus is in your storm, he's unbothered. And he needs you to be unbothered. He needs you to learn to relinquish control. And I know that so many people, the reason why we have control issues is because way back when our control was maybe taken from us or we were in a vulnerable position where someone took control over us. And so now we can't trust the God because most of my counselling that when we get into those situations, the question everybody asks is, why did God allow this to happen? And if he could allow that to happen, then how can I trust that he will come through for me? But can I just open the door so that there's freedom in this place? God cannot change free will. He can't. And so if something bad happened to you because some person robbed you, stole from you, hurt you, that was their free will that went in to do that. God can't stop free will, but you know what He did is He brought His Son Jesus so that He could save you. He brought His Son Jesus so that He could heal you. He brought His Son Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit so that whatever the enemy meant for evil, He would turn around and make it good. You see, He rebuked the wind and He spoke to the waves. He had full authority that, hey enemy, I've got an assignment Because the reason we've got to get to the other side is because there is a man riddled with a legion of demons that needs me. And God knew that I needed to get to the other side, not just because we wanted to go on a joyride. There was a mission of mercy on the other side. And what I've learned is that my battle of the storm was so that I could have authority over a generation. That when I see the enemy robbing kids of their freedom of mind, of their torment, of their anxiety, their pain, that God was showing me that I can have authority. If I can have authority over in, in my own family, I'm going to have authority for a generation. And Jesus had authority over the storm in his boat so that he could have authority over a legion of demons. And he was teaching the disciples, remain unbothered. Be unbothered. With every head bowed, every eye closed. 
I believe Jesus wants to actually deliver people of fear and, and worry. It might even be the smallest thing. But even the smallest thing, like a pebble in your shoe, can totally ruin your day. When you walk every step with that little pebble in your shoe, you feel it. It's all you think about because you're like, I just need to get this pebble out of my shoe. And this is what the enemy loves to do. He loves to throw things at us so that we are distracted and we're consumed by the storm. But oh, I believe God's wanting to raise a generation. He's wanting to raise an army that is unbothered so that the world, when it looks at us, says, I, I know what you're walking through. I know personally what you're going through, but yet why do you seem unbothered? It's almost the most random and it's because God wants to show that there is peace in chaos, that He is our peace, that He is our calm. And so I'd love for all of us to stand right now and if you are walking through a storm or anything that I actually even preached that, because I could have said one off the cuff comment because that's what the Holy Spirit normally does, but it resonated with you. Some of you are control freaks, just of your life. Some of you don't sleep. I, I, I know that that was the Word of the Lord. I know when I was praying that He wanted to fix and break open people's insomnia and anxiety and fear. I know that this is actually a deeper root cause and God wants to deliver. And I have, I have full faith that He wants to do that if you respond to Him because I, but the key for me was that I had to repent because I was taking control where I had no business taking control. I had no business, even though sometimes we confuse love with control. But have you noticed that God is love, but He never controls us? Have you noticed that God's unbothered even when we choose contrary to Him? You don't see Him in a fret and a frenzy. Oh my gosh, they've sinned. What am I gonna do? He's just there, ready and waiting with arms open. God's patient, He's kind, He's good. And if you need to respond to this message for whatever reason, because the Holy Spirit has been moving on your heart right now, raise both hands to heaven. Both hands, both hands. Oh, I can just feel His presence right now in this place. Close your eyes. Hallelujah, I knew this was the Word of the Lord. I knew this was the Word of the Lord. The Word of the Lord wants to come and break the shackles over you. He wants you to now just let go of control. He wants you to actually relinquish it, actually let it go. And some of you have to just repent and say, God, I'm sorry for being the Lord of this situation. I repent for taking control over my finances, control over my family, control over my marriage, control over my children, control over my work situation, control over my future. Control over this, even the sin in my life. I'm trying to fix it. And I just need to relinquish control. So I repent in the name of Jesus. I repent for being the God of my situation at night, tossing and turning and thinking that my worry is gonna work it out. I relinquish control. I yield, I, I repent. I need you to say this. Don't let my prayer, because my prayer is for me. Your prayer is for you. Say it out loud. Say it out loud. I repent. I yield. I repent for my control. God, I need You to show me how to be unbothered.